Hi, Michael. Thank you for speaking with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. What inspired you to make this movie? Well, I first uh, read about the persecution of Falun Gong practitioners. Uh, I guess it was around uh, 2000, late 1999, in uh, some newspapers I would uh, read online. And um, I had never heard of Falun Gong um, or, uh, or the persecution. Uh, and at the time, uh, the rationale that was being given for the persecution was very sort of sketchy. Um, there was no specific reason that was given in, in the news reports that I was reading as to why they were doing this. It was basically just uh, name-calling uh, against the Falun Gong practitioners. And uh, so I became uh, curious about why this persecution was happening. Um, uh, a couple of years later, I actually started uh, to do the practice of Falun Gong myself, and I started reading uh, the teachings. And um, after reading the teachings and hearing the propaganda to support the persecution, what, what that made very clear to me immediately was that this whole thing was based on a foundation of lies. Um, all of the things that they were saying about the persecution uh, and the reasons behind it were not uh, truthful in terms of trying to uh, give excuses as to why they were doing it. Um, and if one reads the teachings of Falun Gong, it's very clear that the, the propaganda is based on complete lies, uh, which is why one of the first things they did when they started the persecution was to destroy uh, all of the teachings that they could find in China so that when they started out with this propaganda uh, against Falun Gong to try to justify this, this persecution, people couldn't have a source to go to where they could read the book and say, well, what the state-controlled media said is not true because it says right here the exact opposite of what they say about these teachings and these people. So knowing about that and knowing that uh, there were a lot of people who were suffering and that uh, a lot of this misinformation was being spread not only through China but around the world, um, I, I had uh, a very strong desire to tell people about what was actually happening because mm -hmm. Shamefully, the Western media hasn't, uh, hasn't reported much on it, and uh, less and less as time has gone by, which has given people the false impression that this persecution has been subsiding, which is anything but the truth. Uh, people are still suffering uh, at this very moment in large numbers in China. It's just not reported. And uh, people who've seen this movie, people who've done some, some study about the persecution on their own as well, they, they have asked me many times, why isn't this on the front page? And, uh, well, my understanding of that rationale is that it has to do with greed and either immediate interests in China or potential interests in China. And so business, government, and uh, media, they've all been staying quiet about it. So who's going to tell people about what's going on? Uh, myself and other pra uh, Falun Gong practitioners around the world have been uh, giving our best efforts to try to inform people and more and more people are starting to find out about what's been happening. Uh, there are uh, many other people of uh, conscience who've been uh, raising awareness as well. Uh, and because my background has been in uh, film and television uh, mainly as an actor, uh, knowing that the medium is a very powerful communicator. Uh, I, won't, I decided to try to uh, make a film to tell the truth about the situation, tell the truth about the persecution, and that's, that's a sandstorm. It's difficult for people to understand how such a persecution could happen. Could you discuss some of the reasons behind it? Well, the persecution itself is, is, is based on a, a propaganda campaign that's founded on lies. Uh, to understand why the persecution is happening, it's not a question of understanding or trying to understand what's wrong with Falun Gong because there isn't anything about Falun Gong that can justify this persecution happening. Uh, it's necessary to understand who's doing the persecuting, which is the Chinese Communist regime. Um, with communist governments through history, I mean, they've used uh, numerous methods to uh, maintain their number one goal, which is always to stay in power. Um, they use violence, they use coercion, they use lies, they use threats. 
uh, there's a, a lot of corruption. Um, and their number one tool from uh, what I've witnessed is uh, thought control. And that's, that's, that's uh, carried out in uh, numerous different ways. Uh, for example, they, they have uh, completely state-controlled media. The, uh, the regime owns uh, and controls most of the media. What they don't control, that media knows what they're not supposed to say. Um, they have the most stringent uh, internet blockade in the world, which is uh, shamefully developed with Western technology. Um, and so this, this system of government uh, uses these methods, and, and through, through history, by, by this point today, they've become extremely corrupt from the uh, top officials right down to the village level. It's, uh, it's virtually impossible for Chinese uh, regime officials to operate in an honest way uh, because the, the system does not work like that. Uh, it, it, it works on lies and bribes and corruption and coercion and, and a lot of, of violence and threats and this kind of thing. So along comes Falun Gong. Uh, you have these teachings that are virtually going in the opposite direction. No interest in the government. It's just a, it's a spiritual practice, a practice that has health benefits. It's based on the principles of truth, compassion, and forbearance, uh, which are the antithesis of what the regime uses to control and manipulate the people. Uh, it was clear that the practice was spreading throughout China very, very quickly. Parks were filling up with people doing the exercises in the morning, and uh, the regime actually did two separate investigations to try and find some, something wrong with the practice in order to try to eradicate this group which was growing bigger than the, the regime was comfortable with. Uh, both investigations, bizarrely, for a, a communist regime, came back with no problems. There's no problem with this group of people. So in late 1998, the regime did a survey that indicated to them that between 70 and 100 million Chinese were practicing Falun Gong, including many uh, high-level communist officials. So you have these uh, people who are going quietly away from what the regime is using to manipulate and control people. And with a communist regime, this is something that they just will not allow. Uh, people thinking not only in a different way, but in a way that's very different. Whether or not they're against the government or involved in politics is not relevant. It's suddenly a group that they're no longer controlling in the same way because they're thinking more clearly, uh, more benevolently, more compassionately. Uh, they're being honest. Suddenly you have some communist officials who do refuse to lie. They do refuse to bribe. They do refuse to accept bribes. So all of these things are happening in society. And it's, of course, from a general perspective, most people would consider a positive thing. But from the perspective of uh, a government that uses violence, coercion, lies, and manipulation to control the people, this is seen as a threat. So the dictator at that time, Jiang Zemin, uh, he ordered that the, per the practice be eradicated uh, by any and all means. So um, he pushed forth uh, this persecution and it was uh, started, uh, it was planned months in advance, un unknown to the public, but it was started uh, against the people directly on July 20th, 1999. Even though I read a lot of very detailed accounts, I, I was hoping to be able to speak with people who had personally been persecuted. And uh, I was able to speak with Zhao Ming, who's a, a Chinese practitioner who's been living in Ireland for a while. He had gone back home and he was abducted and uh, brutally tortured for a long period of time. He's, he's now back in Ireland. Uh, one of the tortures that he, he uh, suffered uh, was being shocked by multiple electric batons. And so just in order to be able to accurately portray these things, I asked if they were comfortable to discuss what had happened to them. And they were, they were fine. And uh, for example, in the scene in the, in the movie where the practitioner is being shocked with multiple electric batons, she's not making any vocal sounds. And that's based on what Zhao Ming told me, which is that he, when that happened to him, he, just, he couldn't make any noise. Um, and so uh, for the force feeding, um, 
someone told me that Lily Lee had been force-fed. And as I was speaking to her and she was sharing with me the specifics of, you know, what that was doing to her. And uh, so these things seem to affect different people differently. Some of them will scream a lot and some of them won't, for example. And she was in a room uh, actually with, she said, about 25 other people who were undergoing the same torture. And as I was speaking with her, uh, it just dawned on me that she would be perfect for the role. So I asked if she would be interested in playing the role, and, and she said yes. And she, uh, she did a really great job. And uh, it was interesting because uh, during the shoot, you know, when we were doing the scenes where she was being tortured, I was uh, sort of keeping an eye on her t to make sure I don't know, maybe she wouldn't be remembering back and upset or anything, but at the end of the, a take, she would be asking everyone else, are you okay? Uh, which was uh, actually quite touching. Um, so she was, she was okay with it. She, she's, she's fine now. Well, I hope after watching the movie that people will have, at the very least, a basic understanding of the kinds of persecution uh, that are happening to these uh, Falun Gong practitioners in China um, and understand that it's real. It's been happening for almost 10 years now. It continues to happen now. And as with the practitioner in the movie, she is the, her character is a school teacher and it's happening to school teachers, it's happening to many senior citizens, it's happening to university students. There have been a couple of infants who've died um, housewives, you know, throughout society there's been a very focused persecution on some of the top universities where some of the uh, professors at Xinhua and, and, and certain places have lost their jobs and lost their careers and been persecuted. And students have been kicked out of school and their futures are finished. Um, and for people to understand that this is something that's happening to just everyday people who contrary to propaganda, don't have some big political scheme to try to take over anything and, and uh, that uh, this situation uh, has been and remains very urgent. And if people want to take a step on their own, they can contact their, their local politicians. Uh, they can uh, write letters to the media and ask them, hey, why don't you report on this? Uh, so it's, it's, it's essentially to uh, raise awareness. The movie has had a lot of success at film festivals where it has won 29 awards. Did you expect that it would receive this kind of response? Uh, actually, no. The, the festivals and the awards were a complete uh, surprise. Uh, when, I, when I started writing this movie, I had one particular group of people in mind, uh, and that that was the people in China who are doing the actual persecution, particularly the policemen. Uh, I wanted to, uh, as Shakespeare said, hold a mirror up to nature. Uh, because oftentimes when someone can st step back from a situation and see themselves, especially from a third person perspective, um, they can often see things much more clearly. And so I was hoping that with this movie, uh, showing a policeman who was obeying rules to persecute people who he knew were innocent. Um, a lot of, I think, the policemen in China are in a situation like that where they don't want to be doing what they're doing. Uh, but if, if they don't, they'll lose their jobs. Their name will be put into the system in China. It'll be very difficult for them to get work anywhere else. Um, they could be persecuted in certain ways. They could lose any benefits that they may have uh, uh, grown over the years. If they have friends and family, uh, you know, there could be pressure applied to them as well. So it's very, very difficult for them. Um, however, when situations get to a point that's so extreme, people have to make hard decisions sometimes. I know for a fact that within um, a month after the film was completed, uh, there was verification that some policemen had seen it. So the Falun Gong practitioners in China who are, they're really amazing. Um, 
they got the files, they made the copies, and somehow <laughs> they got it to the police. Uh, and, and that was verified. So it's up to them, you know, it's up to them. They can, they can think about it and, and make their own decisions. But that's, that's, that's what it's all about. That's what, uh, that's what I sat down to write uh, the movie for. In terms of the film festivals, uh, that was a, a thought that came later on. Uh, I thought that this movie also might have some benefits in terms of helping people outside China also understand the persecution. I didn't know how much people could connect to it uh, because I wrote it with my understanding of the situation in China and what the police are already aware of. Um, but I decided to enter it into a couple of festivals just to see what the response would be and it was accepted and it ended up uh, being screened in uh, about 60 festivals. Uh, Jason Pomerlo, he organized all of the festivals. He, he took over very early on and, and put all that together and uh, organized it. And uh, then the awards, uh, every time it was, it was unexpected and it's, it's very nice, very, very much appreciated. Uh, I met a lot of really uh, good people at all the festivals and did uh, some, some Q&As, about 25 Q&As I'd say, at, uh, one at each of the festivals and they were very good. People had very good questions and we had some really great conversations uh, going from like an hour to two hours. It was, uh, yeah, it was, it was a great experience going to the festivals. Karmic retribution is a theme in the movie. Is this a Western belief as well? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, the idea of good rewards, good, evil rewards is evil. I think it's, just, it's something that's believed in many different cultures. Uh, it's said in different ways. Uh, for example, there's you sow, you reap. Um, there's a very common saying, what goes around, comes around. So people can certainly understand that principle, uh, the idea of karma. Um, I know there are people of different faiths. Some faiths don't specifically talk so much specifically about karma, but the people who practice them do talk about karma and they understand that, uh, that sort of a principle or function of the universe where things balance out in terms of positive and negative interactions and having to pay for your bad deeds, etc. And certainly throughout this, this uh, movie, uh, the policeman uh, painfully becomes aware of, uh, of the reality of, of that, uh, that principle. So. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it's, a, it's a central theme in the movie, definitely. And again, aimed at the policemen to, to try and encourage them to think, think more clearly about what, what it is they're doing. Sandstorm is being released while the persecution is still ongoing. Has it been effective in raising awareness? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's difficult to tell how, how broad an effect uh, the movie has had at this point. Uh, but that certainly is a unique aspect of the movie, which is that it's a movie made to raise awareness of a persecution that's still ongoing, which has uh, a profoundly different uh, potential at being helpful than, of course, a movie that has been made after the persecution has uh, uh, run its course. Um, so uh, I, I hope that people have seen, who have seen the movie will take some kind of action, even, even if it's uh, as simple as talking to their friends about what's happening. Uh, as marketing people know, a word of mouth is uh, the best way to communicate. So even by doing that, I, I hope that uh, people have talked about the persecution. Yeah, they, they, they are. The, the performance is uh, really... Uh, you know, I didn't know what to expect because, uh, I, of course, I knew that most of these actors had never acted before. Um, they have a, a very strong awareness, of course, of the persecution going on in China, and, and, and they were all raised in China, uh, except for uh, Annie Lee. Um, so they have a, a deep connection to, to, to what's, what's happening in the movie, uh, but that doesn't mean they can act. Uh, and I was uh, blown away every day by performances from different people, like the, the, the lead character in particular. He has a, he has a massive uh, role there, and he operates on so many different levels. And uh, he just really inhabited that role, and 
he, you know, he went from fury to tears to uh, a very wide range of emotions throughout the performance and completely believable, on par with any professional. And, uh, and the same throughout. The whole cast was very strong in their performances. And, uh, of course, well, also being an actor myself, I understand that especially with this kind of a movie, a character-driven movie that uh, is about story and it is about character, that if you don't have the performances, you don't have a movie. Uh, because people, it'll be very difficult for them to uh, engage themselves in the movie completely if the performances are something that aren't uh, uh, helping to facilitate that uh, imaginative journey on the part of the audience member. So uh, they, uh, yeah, a uh, huge, huge amount of credit uh, to the performers. Do you practice Falun Gong yourself? Yes, I've, uh, I've been practicing Falun Gong now for uh, about eight years. Um, I first heard about the practice itself through reading about the persecution, which is one of the ironies about the persecution. Uh, before the persecution began, not a lot of people out outside of China had heard about Falun Gong. But then when news started to spread about the persecution, even though a lot of the uh, propaganda and lies from the Chinese regime, they actually did make their way, especially at the beginning, out into the Western media around the world, people were still curious to find out about this, the practice on their own. Uh, and unlike China, they're free to go and search for whatever they want in terms of information. So. A lot of people, they uh, found out about what it was um, and uh, began practicing. It's, it's practiced uh, in over 80 countries now. And uh, personally, when, uh, when, when I had uh, read about the persecution, I had looked uh, on the internet just a little bit. But uh, one day I opened my apartment door and I saw this news flyer that said, Truth, Compassion, Forbearance. And I thought, that's, that's a lot. Those principles, it struck me right away. Um, and I wondered, who is it that's saying this? And I saw that this was Falun Gong. And so I just went on to the internet and checked out some of their websites, uh, particularly the Canadian website, because I was in Canada. And uh, I was wondering what, what the situation was with the practice there. And, over a number of months, I eventually just started reading the teachings on my own and started to do the practice because it's struck a very, very, very profound uh, and deep chord within myself and opened up a much, much broader understanding and perspective on life in general. Thank you. Thank you.